the Texas school shooting, the North Korea summit, and the NFL's national anthem policy. I'm Adam Bierne, and this is The Square Circle. Welcome to The Square Circle. I'm your host, Adam Byrne. Joining us today are Conservative commentator Valerie Greenfeld, Kat Murti of Feminists for Liberty, and political reporter James Rosen. Welcome, everyone. There was another school shooting this week, this time in Santa Fe, Texas, where the gunman killed 10 and injured 13 more before being apprehended. So after the Parkland shooting and the March for Our Lives and the momentum that that created, Kat Murti, what do you think we go from here. Of course, this is a huge tragedy anytime anything like this happens. However, I think we need to understand it in context. It seems as if we're having so many shootings because they're covered so thoroughly in the media. However, um, gun homicides are down about 70% over the last 25 years. And I think that that's something that we still need to keep in mind. It's, of course, always a problem. It's something that we worry about. We want to change the conversation. But um, but this problem isn't a growing one. So it might not be a growing problem, but certainly it's a fairly unique American one, and that's probably because of the preponderance of guns here. So wouldn't that be the answer to increase gun control? It's possible. I mean, I've certainly heard that argument. However, if you start looking at what actually happens, I mean, uh, previously in Texas, we saw sh uh, an attempted shooting a few years ago uh, from actually the place uh, where I graduated high school, the Garland Convention Center, they'd had a um, Draw Muhammad contest and an attempted shooter had come and attempted to uh, murder people who were at the event and it was because an individual with a gun was there and spotted him pulling out his gun, he was able to save everyone. So I think that you can also argue that guns are actually keeping a lot of people safe. Even after uh, this shooting, uh, people polled, including people in that school, for the most part, have said that they would not support gun control. And th these are people who have been traumatized by what's happened to them. So, Valerie Greenfield, I saw you smiling when I asked about gun control. I'm assuming you think that's not the answer. But on Cap Murty's point specifically about armed security, this school had armed school resource officers, and yet still 10 people were killed. So what's the answer for you? Well, I would say that gun control is not the answer, um, but, but what can we do? It's, it's more about the physical security of the, of the building itself. Um, and I also think it's about training. If, if the administrators understand drills, they, they practice different things, what do you do if kind of scenarios, I think it can really help um, the students when this if and when this kind of act, uh, event happens. Um, and I also, after, the, after this recent shoo shooting in Texas, I start, decided I'm going to do my own informal poll and just see how many schools I can just walk into and, and what are they going to do. And I was surprised after all these shootings, you would think that every school would be safe by now. And a lot of them still have not made any kind of measure to um, you know, put in um, cameras on the outside, <coughs> armed, gu armed guards in the front, maybe some kind of um, facility, uh, closing the back doors, making it, making it easier for um, the students to get around and harder for somebody to get in. So there are a lot of, of remedies that have not been used yet. Okay, James Rosen, do you agree? More, less doors is the answer? No, I think uh, gun control is urgently needed. Um, civilized countries have gun, m many more gun controls than we do. It's, mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's a scandal that we don't. And it's particularly outrageous that um, people can buy a a automatic weapons. That's really the biggest problem is the, the powerful weapons that can shoot a thousand rounds in half a minute. They're so much more deadly than other guns. and. Um, I think that the time will come, looking ahead in history, when this period in American history without gun control will be viewed as in, in very barbaric terms. Well, I want to push back on that idea a little bit, because if we look, for instance, at the UK, where guns were banned, uh, they're now facing problems with higher and higher rates of stabbings to the point where they're now going around confiscating knives, including in some cases no, culinary no, no knives. No comparison with the numbers. That's a, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a, um, I, I'll, I'll leave it at that. There's no comparison. Well, numbers. populations are quite different. N no, there's just no comparison. Even if you take account that 
the population as you do it on a per capita basis. The numbers are not comparable. I also think that uh, technologically we're reaching a point past gun control. Uh, if you start looking at things like Defense Distributed and Cody Wilson and um, the fact that people can now 3D print guns uh, or the fact that there, uh, there's a lot of ability to start building these other things. and. Unfortunately, the fact of the matter is is that it's not access to guns that causes people to do these kinds of things. Uh, the shooter, uh, who I will not name, um, in Santa Fe had brought other weapons as well, including Molotov cocktails that he had planned to use. Um, uh, he didn't in this situation. However, I don't think that it's safe to say that had he not had access to that gun, he wouldn't do something similar. But okay. why, why, do, why, why, no, does let's, let's from why does a civilian need an assault weapon? I, I'd like one of you to answer that question. What is an assault Valerie, weapon? Valerie, take, take uh, that. Why don't you take that one? <laughs> I don't think it's the gun that's the problem. It's the person using the gun. And we could use any kind of, um, of household item even that is used in, in jihadism, for example, by terrorists. There are many different ways to kill people. And it's really not about how the person's being killed. It's about by the person who's doing it and how did they get that weapon, whatever it may be, into that facility. But not all weapons are the same. It's a matter of scale. If you can kill 1,000 people in one minute versus only killing 10 people in one minute, minute it's a huge difference. So I, you can't talk about these weapons as if they're the same thing. If the Las Vegas uh, gunman had knives rather than however many guns he had stacked up in his hotel room, do you think he would have killed as many people? No, I don't. Of course. And, and that particular um, event was very difficult to prevent. I mean, there's no room that you could have, um, you know, fixed so that people would not, um, would, so people would be safe. And you know that might be something for people who are putting events together to consider next time. Um, what is the safety possibilities? What are the non-safety possibilities of that particular venue it, for the future? It would have been I, very. It would have been very easy. Stop crazy guys like him from being able to walk in and buy tons of um, automatic weapons that kill lots of people. That's an easy fix. Semi-automatic. Kat, if I may bring up a point, you mentioned the UK. I don't think it's any secret that that's where I'm from. <laughs> and we had a mass shooting <coughs> when I was in school. And after that, they took away handguns. They banned handguns. Mm -hmm. And basically, personal ownership of fire firearms basically disappeared. We've had zero mass shootings in the UK since then. Why do you think that is? Well, I mean, I still think that you haven't gotten rid of uh, violent crime. And I think that the US is, as you yourself said, fundamentally different from the UK in many ways, including the fact that, uh, you know, there's a lot of guns here. And I think that it will be fundamentally impossible for us to be able to collect all of those guns without going into very illiberal uh, methods of doing so. But I'd also like to step back and talk a little bit about some of the motivations for why we're seeing more of these uh, shootings nowadays. I mentioned it earlier, but they're increasingly getting coverage in the media. and. You know, we made a decision on this show not to mention the shooter's name. That's However, um, over and over and over again, uh, we saw this even starting with Columbine. There was very much this idea that this was a way for someone to build their name, to be in the media. And now these shooters, you know, their names really are all across uh, the, they're all across the internet, they're everywhere you go, everyone knows who they are, and they become heroes for people, for the kinds of disturbed people who are looking to kill other people. This so these stories should be, so should these stories be ignored? Well, no, they should tell the story, but you don't have to put the person's name. Right. You know, no you names, can Google no that photos. if you have to have that information, but to put somebody's face on, on a magazine like they did with the Sanarv brothers to make them look, you know, sexy or you know, appealing, you know, that's, that's really not something that the, the media should be doing. And that's the Boston Marathon bombers exactly. you were referring to there. So this point about school security was brought up, and I mentioned the, the mass shooting that happened in Scotland, where I'm from, and after that, Every visitor to a school had to go in and out the main entrance. That's the only one you could get in. So doesn't that have to be part of the solution? Yes. Well, uh, my son attended schools in Fairfax County, not far from here, and that's been the policy at their schools. Um, it's one of the largest school systems, in, uh, public school systems in the United States, and that's been their policy for years. And I'm, I'm, I'm surprised. You have to get buzzed into. Not only is there just one entrance, you have to get buzzed in by someone in the office in the reception area who's, who sees who you are and who knows you. And I'm, I'm just kind of surprised that more schools don't have controls like that. Okay, well, we'll see if more schools will implement them in the future. I see it seems to be the, probably the obvious solution we could all agree on. And I'd like to remind our viewers now that you can submit questions to our guests through our website, www.publicsquare.net, or via Facebook or Twitter, and we'll answer as many as we can live on air towards the end of the show.
Also this week, the much-anticipated summit between President Trump and North Korean leader Kim Jong-un has apparently been called off. Recent remarks by <coughs> excuse me, Vice President Mike Pence and National Security Advisor John Bolton may have played a role. So, James Rosen, was this comparison to Muammar Gaddafi by Pence and Bolton a wise one? Is that why this summit has collapsed? <laughs> this summit could have and probably would have collapsed for a thousand different reasons. Um, I mean, in Donald Trump, we finally have a president who's more unpredictable than Kim Jong-un or in the North Korean leader. And this summit might be rescheduled and canceled and rescheduled and canceled five times in the next five days, given the personalities of these men. But they have both gotten already, I think, what each of them wanted. Kim Jong-un was talked about as uh, meeting with the President of the United States. He got worldwide coverage. He wasn't portrayed as, as, as an insane person, as he's often portrayed. He got a lot of relatively positive coverage for, for him. And Donald Trump was mentioned as a possible Nobel Peace Prize recipient, which is uh, rather startling. But so, so they can both walk away from it and, you know, and, and no risk. Um, but I still think it's possible that it will happen. I don't think it's likely. I, th I think it, it may not happen on the date it was going to happen, but it still could happen. So, yeah. Valerie Greenfield, President Trump's unpredictable. Do you agree? Is it a good thing I or a bad thing? I do agree, and I think it's a great thing because that's what leadership is about. If you can um, predict in advance what everyone's going to do, then then there's no negotiation going on. He's supposed he's the king of negotiation, and I think that the reason that this conference didn't happen or this meeting didn't happen is because it wasn't supposed to. It's part of the agenda. It's part of the negotiation. Um, to say, look, you know, the United States is very serious about what's going on, and if, if, if Kim Jong-un doesn't come to the table in the proper way, and we don't believe that he's really going to do what he says he's going to do, then, then there's, no me there's no point in meeting. Why do you think the South Koreans, one of America's closest allies, and of course North Korea's neighbors, why do you think they didn't know about this decision? The South Korean president said he was very perplexed. It seemed to take sure. them by surprise. I'm not sure if he's taken by surprise. I'm not sure if it was necessary for him to know. I don't have the background for um, either of those, the, the way the decision making was made. But on the other hand, you know, the diplomacy and the way that this stuff is laid out is done for a specific reason, and it's done very meticulously. And I think that Trump is the first guy to even get Kim Jong-un to even speak. You know, all of these administrations, this has been going on for 30 years. And, you know, the IAEA's come in, and they've been thrown out, and there's been no movement on this subject until Trump came in. So I think, you know, whether you agree he's a predictable or unpredictable isn't really important. What it's important is that he was working on getting um, North Korea to the table. And I want to add one more thing is I think the reason, another reason that this didn't happen is because of China. And, um, you know, there are a lot of problems. Uh, China and North Korea have a bond there, and they don't want to um, anger China because they need, they need to keep that bond. So I think that has something to do with it. So, Kent Murthy, is this a negotiation masterpiece by President Trump? I'm not quite sure I would describe it that way, but I do think that we need to uh, take a look at North Korea itself. It's a very small country, and it could be a very inconsequential country, and they have an outsized amount of power in the world uh, in foreign policy, in foreign negotiations, in large part because the United States is so involved. It's because this is dealing with the United States that they're even able to get this much attention. And if we look at just Kim Jong-un, in a very real way, accomplished many of the goals he wanted to accomplish uh, in the last several weeks, North Korea has been constantly in the media. They've been um, they've been touting their ability um, to use nuclear weapons. Uh, they've been meeting in China and South Korea. Uh, th they got a lot out of this deal, um, and I think that that's a huge concern. And I think also the fact of the matter is there wasn't a whole lot on the table for them to get from this summit. They're not going to denuclearize at this point because I do think that they, they are looking at the Gaddafi problem and they're saying, hey, you know, the last time that a, a powerful, terrible dictator came to the table and agreed to denuclearize, soon after the American government came in, swept him out of power, and he was dead. That's not something that looks appealing to Kim Jong-un. Uh, and I think the other thing that we have to consider as well is that the North Korea we're dealing with now is quite different from the North Korea of even 15 years ago. Thanks to the internet and um, in, thanks in part probably, uh, I, I never want to give him credit for anything, but thanks in part uh, to Kim Jong-un's slight shift away from his father's and grandfather's views, um, 
people in North Korea just aren't living in as much of a hermit kingdom anymore. And that's also because they're able to work uh, lim in limited amounts outside of the country. It's because there's more access to information and the state's not able to control that information in the way that they used to be able to. I'm not saying that North Korea is not a problem, but I think that as long as the United States remains so powerfully involved in North Korea, it's a powder keg waiting to happen. Oh, we're going to have to talk about Dennis Rodman there for a second. <laughs> but James, James Basketball Rosen, diplomacy. What, right. what impact do you think pulling out of the Iran deal, which happened obviously shortly before this collapse in planned talks uh, was announced, what impact do you think that had? I think, I don't think it had huge impact, but I think, I think it had some impact. I mean, it was, it was a bit incongruous to pull out of um, a, nu a nuclear deal with Iran and at the same time that the president is saying he wants a nuclear deal with North Korea. The, I think the North Koreans maybe were thinking, and, and perhaps the South Koreans were thinking, well then what, what's the sense of going to all this bother if, if, if it's not going to go anywhere? Uh, so I, I, think it, I think it played some role. Okay. Well, uh, finally tonight, the NFL is announcing a new policy on players protesting the national anthem. Players will now be required to either stand or remain in the locker room while the anthem is performed. Any player protesting on the field will cause his team to be fined. So, Valerie Greenfield, is this a smart move from the league trying to protect its image or are they trampling on players' constitutional rights? I think that this should have been taken care of last year. Um, by perhaps each individual corporation. Each team um, president should have his own corporation and have the, 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 uh, the rules for that company. So as those players are coming out, they all have a uniform idea. This is what my job is. And the First Amendment has to be kept. So, you know, they can, they can feel free to protest anywhere they want, anytime they want, but when they're on the job, they're representing their company and they're representing their team. And I think that if they would have done this last year, instead of making the NFL go through it because they've lost so much money and they've lost so much credibility, I think it would have nipped the whole problem in the bud. So they can protest anytime or anywhere just not in front of the biggest audience they're going to get? <laughs> unless, unless that particular um, company decides that that's okay, I think it should be an individual like the states. It's a federal, you have the federal, comp uh, the federal law and then you have the state law. And if it was me, I would have given each team their own, their owner, their own decision. And I think some teams have actually said that uh -huh. they are going to cover any fines if their players do choose to protest the National Anthem. Exactly. Kat Murty, where do you stand on this? Well, honestly, that makes a lot of sense uh, for those teams to do. If you look at it, um, the Cato Institute did a study uh, last year that showed that the majority of Americans, whether or not they agree with the football players kneeling, do not believe that they should be fi uh, fired for doing so. The, there is a discrepancy. 65% of Republicans do believe that they should be uh, fired. But that's a matter of patriotic correctness, I think, which is we hear all the time about political correctness, but I think that there's this other idea as well that you can't criticize anything uh, that has to do the, with nationalism in this country. And I think that it's because of the fight between these two that we're seeing that played out on the NFL stage. The same folks who had no problem with Tim Tebow kneeling to pray have a whole lot of a problem with Colin Kaepernick kneeling to support Black Lives Matter. For different reasons. Well, and that's what people on both sides would say that. It's for different reasons they support one or the other. And I think that's part of it. And that's why I think Valerie's idea of having each team decide might make a lot more sense for their market share. That said, I think this is often discussed as a First Amendment issue. And this is a private organization. The First Amendment does not apply in that context. This is not a government. Uh, however, once we start looking at it, the U.S. government pays the NFL, pays specific teams a lot of money for them to do military appreciation, for them to do the anthem, because they treat it as a propaganda arm. So I think that if you start talking about the First Amendment, we can start talking about the fact that these teams get outsized amounts of government money. and. Even worse, our president, uh, while commenting on this issue, is not only pushing in one way, which he's allowed to do uh, in, one, in some extent, but he's also saying that he believes that players who would kneel 
uh, shouldn't have the job, not only that, but maybe they shouldn't be allowed in this country. And I think that once the president's saying that if you have certain opinions, you shouldn't be allowed in this country, that is a huge First Amendment yeah, issue. James <laughs> Rosemary, we will come to you, but I did want to mention that point. The president did say on Twitter that players, if they didn't want to stand for the anthem, should leave the country. Do you agree? No, of course not. <laughs> okay. Of course not. I mean, we know that um, Trump has a has a Twitter finger, and, and and that's all right, you know. But um, you know, we have the First Amendment not because we want to throw people out. We want we have the First Amendment because they have the freedom. Um, to, to say whatever they want and to protest. On the other hand, we have military people that are out there fighting for that freedom. And I think if, you know, they, they deserve to have the respect um, for what they're doing for us to, to have the freedom. So it's a, it's a complicated issue. So is, there, is that link that strong that if you don't stand for the anthem, you're not supporting our troops? No, I, I, I don't think so. I'm, I'm not a, I don't believe that flags um, or anthems are the true measure of patriotism. Uh, they're, you know, they're symbolic. Um, and, uh, I, you know, I'm old enough to remember during the Vietnam War, uh, protesters burned the American flag. Um, I didn't like it. Um, it. It bothered me. Um, it would still bother me to see the American flag burning. But I think the, um, the principle that they should have the right to do that is more important than the flag. But if I think they're that coming, a burning American flag is actually one of the best symbols of patriotism in this country. Uh, not because I support burning the flag, but because that is the freedom that America stands for. Right. If you can't burn a flag, if you can't not stand during the pledge, then what is it that makes this country it, it, great? And makes it different than other countries, exactly. Mm -hmm. So, but what of this point that the teams, these players that come out, they wear very openly the uniform of the team, the organization that they're representing, and if the team doesn't want them, to kneel or protest the national anthem, why shouldn't they just keep them in the locker room? Well, I mean, the, the team um, controls them, controls their contracts. The, the team can do, can do that, and uh, I think some teams uh, will do that. Um, but you know, the, the the players have to decide. Now, I guarantee you that Tom Brady would not be treated the same as uh, a third string quarterback. I mean, the, the, their ability and their star power will make a difference in how they get treated. Okay, well, I think they, they said that Colin Kaepernick is probably the best quarterback not to be playing <laughs> yeah. football right now, but maybe yeah, we're getting yeah. into a sports debate there instead. So uh, now it's time to take some questions from our viewers, and uh, we'll start with Adam Fuller, who asks, people keep saying we need to do something about mental health, but what exactly can be done, and would it have prevented the Santa Fe shooting? Is mental health part of the answer? Captain Morty, what do you think? It's possible. Uh, the problem is, is that I don't think that we should blame all these shootings on mental health problems. I, it's very strange to say that it's only in these cases. Uh, the problem is, is that in the Santa Fe shooting, we're not really sure who or what the motivation was. We've seen everything from folks suggesting it could have been a mental health problem. Um, the shooter's own father suggesting it was because he was bullying. He was being bullied, although he didn't actually attempt to shoot any of these people that his father says were bullying him. Mm -hmm. Who he did shoot, however, was the first person that he shot was a girl, uh, as one of his former classmates that he'd been harassing for months, who had gone to the school, who had asked this to stop, who, uh, who uh, we saw news headlines all across the country say, essentially blaming her, saying that she, uh, stood up in class and made a comment and essentially suggesting that's why she got shot. And I think that that's disturbing, extremely disturbing. And I think that if anything, more than mental health, that was a flag. When someone's coming up and saying, hey, my classmate is making me feel very unsafe and it was just written over until we got to this point, I think that that's the real problem here. That does seem dangerous. Where do you stand on this mental health component of these mass shootings that we seem to see it's way too often? Well, I, th I think almost by definition, uh, anybody who kills um, you know, dozens or hundreds of people uh, is mentally ill. Uh, you, you know, you're not a mentally healthy person if, if, if that's what you choose to do. It's, it's just tautological. And um, America, the United States, is a more violent country than most other countries. Um, whether we have more mentally ill people per capita than other countries, I don't know. But mentally ill people being able to put their hands on assault weapons and other powerful guns, that's a, that's a lethal, bad combination. Okay, and Valerie, we'll come to you for the, for our, first for our next question, which comes from Celia Hernandez, who asks, and I think we covered it a little bit, she asked, is the new NFL policy unconstitutional? 
you think we might see it in this in the courts? Could we see this in the Supreme Court? I, I think it's not un unconstitutional because it's a corporate decision and if you're the leader of the corporation you make the you make the rules and these are employees of the organization if there was a mandate everyone must do this then that's a different story but um, this is not a, a government mandate this is a corporate I, I think it's a little sticky normally I would agree with what she's saying a private company can set their own rules your rules of employment are your own however the National Football League takes a lot of money from the federal and from state and from local governments and you know we've seen in previous Supreme Court cases uh, public schools have to allow uh, back in Vietnam they had to allow the black armbands they have to allow p speech and I think if the NFL is going to continue to take corporate welfare perhaps then it starts to become more of a question they're not funding themselves they take money for stadiums they take money to do these displays um, I think that it is a completely uh, not at all a First Amendment issue, provided that they stop taking that corporate welfare. Absolutely. Why would they get corporate welfare at all? I mean, they make more money than most any other company. They're, I don't even understand why they get anything. If they're going to get it, they need to use it for security. Okay. That's the whole issue we're talking about. And James Rosen, what chance it ends up in the courts for you? Um, you know, the, whether uh, NFL players should be able yeah, to force this to stand. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if it goes to the Supreme Court. Um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if it doesn't. I don't think it's the most pressing issue of the day, but it's obviously an issue that, that is symbolic of, of a lot of things and that Americans get worked up over. Okay. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised. All right, well, I guess we'll wait and see on that one too. But now it's time for our regular segment, the most underreported story of the week. And who would like to start? Okay, go ahead, Val. The most underreported uh, story for this week, and actually for several weeks now, is the Gaza. What's going on in the Gaza Strip? Not only is it underreported, but it's misrepresented. Um, my son actually is in the Israeli Defense Forces and spent three weeks along the Gaza Strip border, and um, the media has actually been, you know, blaming the Israelis for for X amount of deaths versus X amount of deaths, and that's you know it's fine in football to take scores on each side, but when you come to a, a war, it doesn't work that way. Um, the Israelis are defending their border, and they have the right to do that. They've done everything that they can to warn the people on the other side, who are the, actually the Palestinians are um, being used as pawns by Hamas. And they're the ones that are really losing out here. And um, it's not reported properly. It's, um, Israel has sent over flights, information, um, all kinds of things to tell the Palestinians do not come towards this border. And they're being paid by Hamas to, uh, to die. And their families get paid for that. James Rosen, your most underreported story this week. Well, I have a much different story, and it's, it's being reported uh, as a financial story. I think it has larger significance, which is that today, for the first time, the value of Netflix uh, surpassed the value of Disney. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was, uh, if, I'm remember, if, if I'm remembering right, Netflix is worth today $153 billion. Disney is $152 billion. And I think that signals um, a major cultural shift where uh, people are uh, n uh, not going to movie theaters, they're not buying cable TV, they're streaming more and more programming uh, by computer. Changing times, indeed. And Kat Marty, your most underreported story. Yeah, so, uh, well, both of these stories were reported, but I think there's a different spin on them a little bit. Uh, we had Gina Haspel last week was confirmed as the first female lead of the CIA and this week we saw Stacey Abrams become the first black woman to uh, first black woman to get a major party nomination for governor in the state of Georgia now I think that as we've heard these talked about we've heard people on the left people on the right saying whether or not this is a feminist issue and it tends to be split right around the party lines and I think that the big story here is that we're reaching a point where a woman getting into a position of power is not in and of itself a victory for feminism. I think it's what her policies are and what she's pushing. And as long as we continue to view women as a part of a collective, as just only being represented by being a woman before anything okay. else, it's, uh, it's still sexist. Yeah, so some history making there too. And that's all for this week. I'm Adam Bierne. Thanks for watching The Square Circle. We'll see you next week.